I've had enough church, I'm willing to go home, but <laughs> I'll tell you what, I, I, would, I would take the presence of God and the move of God and the love of God and, the, and the, uh, just being with him over anything. You know, I said for years, you know, how people would tell me, oh, you got to go here and you got to go there. It's so pretty. It's so beautiful. It'll be worth it. And on and on, and I remember so many years of going, yeah, but there is nothing, nothing I'd rather have than the presence of God. And I've gotten the privilege for years of getting to sneak into the church, and, and I mean with keys, but sneak into the church, although I forgot my keys once or twice and had to find a window. Don't tell anybody. No, seriously, and, and where I've gotten to co go into churches, and it's been, golly, most of my life now, really. And um, where I get to come in, and I put on worship, I call it intercessory worship music, I made a mix, and anyways, come in and just get loud with God. You know, I'm a lot louder without you than I am with you. If you think I get loud with you guys, 
If you ever come to the building when I'm the only one in here, and usually you can't tell, is if you're outside, you'll hear me. And not everything I do. But I get loud with God. Because I want him, I want to praise him, and I, and I, and I, and I, I worship him, and I, um, and I pray loudly, and then I pray softly, and sometimes it's only my lips moving. And I'm all alone with him. It's just what he puts on my heart. It's how he leads me. And I'm so grateful to the Lord for getting to do that and getting to have that intimacy in my life. And I, I would take that over, you know, honestly, and I'm not putting down Hawaii. It was cool. We had friends and family that sent us to Hawaii a f two, three, four years ago, whatever that was. I don't remember. And yeah, we got to be part of a conference, but, but we couldn't have afforded that, but they helped us to afford it. And then uh, by being part of the conference, we actually got our hotel, and that was super cool. And we stayed in this stupid, expensive place, but we didn't have... Anyways, God provided. But you know, I'll be honest, I've grown up in Oregon all my life, and when I got there, I'm like, wow, it's pretty cool. But Oregon is awesome. I've been to parts in Oregon where I have climbed and I have gone different places and done different things. And, and I've seen some vistas and climbed mountains and done stuff where I'm just like, Oregon is just, you know, Hawaii is cool, but I think Oregon is as good or better. So I enjoyed Hawaii. That was really cool. But, you know, it was, it was still... It was when I went out before the Lord early in the morning on the beach and I was worshiping him and praising him because, you know, the, the, the waves crash loud, don't they? And I'm praising him and I'm glorifying him and I'm magnifying him. And that was the most beautiful part of being there. And then one of my favorite parts of being there was the time that I, I teed off because they took us on this ridiculously expensive golf course. And I teed off and I almost hit the guy on the Zamboni. That's what I call the big mowers. <laughs> it's a good thing he was like this. It went right over his head. From that point on, wherever I teed off, all of the workers would hide behind things. That was awesome in my book. I'm like, they fear me. <laughs> they just knew I was a bad. Was... They asked me ahead of time. They said, are, are you any good? And I go, if you like a laugh, I'm great. <laughs> so I can hit hard. I can hit long. But anyways, I have a lot of fun. But I, well, again, just thank you, Lord, so much for your presence today. We need it so bad. So... <laughs> These screens are just going to continue to scroll. We're talking about the book of Jonah today. If you could read this real quick, you'd get the whole story. And then, of course, it goes through. When I built this, these are NASA pictures. I need to give them the, the acknowledgement of that. I think I left the little NASA thing somewhere on something. Anyways, and so this, this tells you where Nineveh is. It's uh, in the Mosul, Iraq province. Um, it is in the, the, anyways, it's modern day Iraq in the Mosul province. And, um, it really interesting. You'll see a picture where it'll be a picture and there's a picture behind it. Somebody holding a picture. And that's the difference between what they found as they were uncovering Nineveh. Um, and then what happened, what it looked like after the ISIS Islamics tried to, uh, destroy because they're trying to destroy the things that prove the Bible. Um, in, eight, in the 1800s, there was a guy who was um, uh, an archaeologist who uncovered um, uh, Nineveh. And prior to that point, or right up to that point, Nineveh was considered not a true city. It, there wasn't enough records. It was the Assyrian Empire's seat, but... Um, they, they didn't think it actually existed, that it was folklore, whatever it was, um, until, and it, well, let me say this, and the Bible was losing popularity in the world because secular humanism was starting to take root, take 
hold and causing people to go, we don't need to listen to the Bible anymore. We're not, you know, there is no evidence, blah, blah, blah. And then they find Iraq, or they find, not Iraq, they find Nineveh, and they find the library, and they find all of these um, uh, uh, obelisks and different things, and it's written in cuneiform, and, and which, like ancient Chinese and, and different stuff. But the point is, is that the, the writings that are from that date match the story of the Bible, which is a history book. And it, and it absolutely made the Bible come alive in the world again and made a lot of people go, we need to listen to what he says because he keeps proving himself true and real and honest and without fault. Do you know that this is the only history book that doesn't need rewritten? Do you know history is almost always written from the side of the conqueror? In Iraq, or in Iraq, in um, Nineveh, they even wrote where they repented. They, they literally wrote the things that they went through. And, and you'll sort of have to forgive the last screens, although I want you to know, in the last screens that come up on the loop, it talks about their destruction. A hundred years later, they went from uh, repenting to going back to who they were. And let me tell you who they were. The Assyrians, there was one Assyrian king that was one of the worst that ever lived on the earth. And one of the things that the Assyrians were really good at was taking those, what we would call a fence post, and, you know, I don't know how big they were, and they would make it a pencil end on one end, and they were, do we have any little guys in here? They were experts at impaling people on them and keeping them alive maximum amount of time. Now, that's pretty nice of them, isn't it? Why am I saying that? Because in the, in the story of Jonah, in, the, in the, the book of Jonah, in the Bible, Jonah is a prophet, and the Lord says to Jonah, Jonah, sir, I mean, if you're smart, you say, sir, or yes, sir, or you get on your face, right? If God talks, it's really wise to listen, Right? And he says, yeah, and the, and the Lord says, I want you to go over to Nineveh, who has been, now, we don't get all this dialogue, but here's what Jonah would have heard and understood is this. I want you to go, I want you to go east, over, through the Mediterranean, into the Mediterranean, past the Euphrates River, up by the Tigris River, and I want you to go to Nineveh, the seat of the Assyrian Empire, and I want you to preach for me, this is the picture of before ISIS and after ISIS, by the way. Anyways, I want you to preach for me to these people. And I want you to give them a message for me. And, and Jonah probably was wise enough in that moment to not go over my dead body. Instead, what he did, he just shut up and ran. And he was running. He tried to run to Spain. There will be a picture of the Mediterranean come up. It will show Nineveh uh, for you will be on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, you'll see the word Tarshish, which is actually modern Spain. And it was the farthest place he knew to get away from what God told him to go do. And I don't know about you, but some of us have tried to run from our call or tried to run from what God wanted us to do. I'd ask you to raise your hand, but that would be embarrassing for all of us. Anyways, so there it is, talking about that. But the point is... God told Jonah, go to Nineveh, give them my message that they need to repent or be devastated in 40 days. Jonah just, we know the story, if you've, written, if you've heard it, in the story, Jonah goes down, gets a ticket, gets on a boat, a ship, he gets on a ship, and he's trying to go across the Mediterranean as far as he knows. He might have even discovered America if he, went, if he would have went as far as he wanted to, which was as far away as possible. Well, he would have ran into us. Jonah would have been our discoverer. But instead, 
get out onto the water, and they're out there, and the Mediterranean is a pretty big place, and they're out there on the water, and God doesn't like Jonah's rebellion. And so God sends a storm upon the sea, so much so that the, the guys on the boat are trying to figure out whose fault is it that we're going to get killed? Who, who would it? And they're like, so what did you do? Well, what did you do? Well, what did you do? What did you do? What did you do? It's got to be somebody's fault. And so they drew lots. No, I'm just kidding. They threw the, you know, it's usually bones, and they throw those out. And whoever got the big bone was the, the, the one who was picked like, dude, you're it. We used to do draw straws as a kid. Anybody ever do that? Draw straws as a kid. Who jumped out first of the hayloft? Who was the first one to jump out of the, 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 the house? Or who was the first one to jump off the dam site there in Cherry Grove? Somebody told me the other day the name of that again. And anyways, <laughs> we were... Um, so, they drew lots, and it comes down to Jonah. Well, where did they find Jonah? Well, they have... this. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. You know, they're going through all this storm and everything, and Jonah is inside the boat, down in the bottom of the ship... And he's snoring. This guy probably needs therapy. I mean, he's snoring. Um, kind of funny, the other day I was talking to Jen's dad, Tom. And while we were talking, it was about 4.30 in the afternoon. And I kept nodding off while we're talking. Guess I was a little tired. I took muscle relaxers two days in a row. And I, they apparently hadn't got out of my system yet. Because I'm sitting there just junk. But I could still hear him. It's kind of cool. I mean, I don't know. I might have misinterpreted something he said. Could be, right? Anyways, but the point is, he's out, he's down there, he's zonked out. The captain of the ship comes down and he goes, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he'll be the one who will save our bacon. That was not a kosher joke. Just plain. <laughs> Jonah gets up. And he's like, you know, it gets down to, they go, so who are you? Who, whom do you serve? Who do you belong to? What is your people? What is your culture? What is your religion? Tell us, tell us, tell us. Because we're out of, we've tried everything amongst us. And everything we have done for our, fault, well, what we know to be false gods. Everything we've done was no use. So what about you? What in the world, what in cat hair did you do? Well, it says that Jonah had already told them that he was running from Adonai, from Yahweh. He was, he was running from the Lord. And they're like, so what? give us a little bit of details. And he says, yeah, the Lord told me to go do something. I said, and he said, I ran instead of saying yes. I ran and I'm trying to get away from the presence of the Lord so I, I cannot do his will so, and they're like, so what should we do? And he said, oh, that's easy. Throw me over. Now, you might at first think Jonah was being merciful to the guys on the boat. That he was being merciful to them and probably family member, who knows, but who all was on the boat. Because, anyways, but instead it was probably just Jonah going, yeah, just throw me over. At least I'll die instead of going to Nineveh. Now, I want you to stop for a second and think about this. What is your Nineveh? What is your Nineveh? Who is it or what is it that you've gone through in life? I had a horrific childhood. I mean, not every minute. <laughs> it was bad. And, you know, mine was worse than yours. I'm kidding about that. In, in the only reason I said it that way is this. Is that there's this new weirdness that's out there like... Oh, yeah, well, my bad was worse than your bad. Oh, yeah, well, my bad was worse than your bad. Let's quit bad and let's instead, let's, you know, let's, let's stop that. But the point is, is that Jonah would rather die than do God's will. And if you know God for who he is, when he tells you to do something, he's not asking. He's commanding, right? He's telling us what to do. Long story short, they throw him in the water. The sea dies down. 
The wind and the waves stop, and they start worshiping the Lord. Jonah's rebellion caused them to meet Yahweh. And they, they dedicated themselves to the Lord. They gave sacrifices, and they said, in, well, they made dedications. They said, we are yours. Because Jonah told him God, was the, God is and was the creator of all things, and he was the God of the heavens and the God of the earth and the God of the sun, moon, and stars. He's the God of everything. And, there, and probably at first when he's saying it, they're like, well, I don't know about that, but we're willing to throw you in if you think it's going to work. And he wasn't, he wasn't maybe, because the Ninevites probably had impaled son of, some of maybe even Jonah's family. Because that's the way they were. And they had come into Israel and they had done very bad things and, and attacked them and done very bad things to a lot of people, definitely to Israelites, a lot of Israelites, on and on and on. And it went on for a lot of years. And so Jonah, I, I don't know, I think if I was Jonah, I might do exactly what Jonah did. I think it's wise not to go over my dead body because that's just not a good thing. Might be like, what'd you say? No. But instead, he just ran. And God doesn't want to do that. Anyways, but the point is, so Jonah runs, and he's willing to die instead of do well. Instead, he gets in the water, and God gives him a deliverance of a fish to swallow him. Most would say a whale. Um, there are other fish in the sea you and you fit and he was in this fish's stomach for three days and while he's in there now it appears he may have died or may not have died i don't think that's as big of a deal except at some point he comes to his senses and he says god i'll do anything you ask and God recommissions him by having him, now get this, this is what you want in your life, hurled up on the beach. Raise your hand if you want to be in the belly of a fish and hurled on the beach. Huh? Fish food? Fish leftovers? Sushi? I don't know. Anyway, so while he's in there, the Lord gets his attention. Good grief. Three days. I don't know, the moment you're to respond <laughs> three days yeah there you go but here again as he's in there and he says god i will i will pay my vow i which is i will do anything you ask and he doesn't seem to really be repentive he just says okay 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 i give now i don't know how much room he had in there and god recommissions him it was either right before or right after he gets hurled <laughs> on, the, on the beach. And, he's, and God recommissions him and says, Now, go and say what I want you to say. 40 days if you don't repent, and then I'm going to wipe you off the face of the earth. So Jonah gets to Nineveh. Now, there's a couple of interesting things not everybody knows. Something that's interesting about it is in Nineveh, one of their primary false gods that they followed after was a fish god. And he gets there, and, and, and he's probably told somebody, yeah, I had to be in a fish for three days because of you guys. And I'll bet you know that by the time he gets to Nineveh, he's had it. He doesn't want to be there. He's doing what he's told, but he doesn't want to be there and I'll bet it says that he, it was, the city was so big that there was 120,000 people. God said this to Jonah. He says, when Jonah says, I don't want to go, he goes, what about the 120,000 people who don't know their left hand from their right hand? And what about all those animals? And, you know, and, and anyways, Jonah still ran. So he gets there, and it's a three days walk. And in their speed of walk, I don't know if you've been to a foreign country, like I've been to Africa and and different places in the world where they walk a lot. And I'll tell you what, you're jogging 
or running to keep up with those people. When they say it's a three days walk, that's a and it's a three days walk just to go across this city, which is a city state with walls. And he gets one day in. And I don't know if somebody finally just said, dude, why are you here? But all of a sudden he speaks out and he's, he says what God tells him to say. And, and I'll bet he was ticked. Sorry if you don't like that. I bet he was ticked off. I bet he was mad. I bet he was like, repent for in 40 days you're gonna die burn yes i mean hey you're ticked at those people you're mad at you've had enough of them you don't like how they've treated your family your country your nation peoples of the world you know they're like the worst dirt bags of the world at the time in the way that they're acting, the things that they're doing, and God sends you to give them a message that might bring them to deliverance. And he's and and I bet he didn't get up there and go, saith the, the Lord. Bet he didn't do that. Besides, his language was different. But instead, he got up there and, and he's just like, you guys are going to burn in 40 days because you're not going to repent. <laughs> and they went, I, I think he's serious. Think about it. I mean, he got three days in the fish. He tried to run. God wouldn't let him. God causes him to be there. He says, fine, I'll do it. I wonder if he was crazy enough to have a tantrum. He kind of does, really, when you, you read the book. So God sends him anyways. And, you know, honestly, I'll bet the fact of what Jonah went through that made him so upset set him up to preach it just like it needed to be said. Because think about this. If somebody's a direct communicator, how do you have to speak to them? Directly. I've had people in my life, and of course I you know, did multi-million dollar business and stuff, and I've had a lot of people in my life that were direct communicators, and the only way I know how to deal with them is, so, what are you doing? You don't go, oh, what's up? What are you doing? Oh, I would like you to do that. You can't do that with them because they won't listen to you. I had somebody that uh, spoke inappropriate to Becky many, many years ago when we were at a different church, 100, well, yeah, it is probably 100 miles away. Anyways, 100 years ago and 1,000 miles away. And this person got in Becky's face, and we were just newly married. And this person got in her face, and I stepped between the two of them. And I looked at this lady, who was my fr one of my best friend's wives. And I looked at her, and I stepped in between. And I said, you will not ever treat my wife like that again. She's under my protection. And I stared her down. And you know what she did? Because she was an absolute type A direct communicator. And she backed off and she apologized. And from that day forward, we were buds. I'm not kidding. Because she found somebody that could talk like her. But I told her, you won't talk like that to my family. Anyways... So Jonah gets there, he gives the message, and he's expecting they're going to respond the way he thinks they should, or that they would, based on the way they're living their lives. Somebody left my coffee down here. Shame on you. <laughs> but they don't. He gives the message, and I'll bet he was a fiery preacher. You know, you hear about, and every once in a while, I heard, heard praise God, that he got to go be with the Lord this week, or this week or last week, but praise the Lord for such a godly man who did such a good job. But I've actually been in a couple trainings um, where he was the speaker, and one time, I'll tell you what, he dressed down the church. He smacked them down one side and up the other, and he, it was a very corrective message that he brought for a few minutes before he got into the sermon because the church needed to be corrected, and he did it. It was on international recording, 
and it's still to this day. But he, he did what needed to be done to make things be seen for what they were and so that they could be corrected. Again, God here is having Jonah go and give a very, uh, very strong message that is, uh, he, again, it's simply this. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. I know. He couldn't have sent me to, send, to, to say that message because I, 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 had, I, I, I preached too long. He'd have to send some, Jonah ticked off to only say what he wanted said to get them corrected, right? In 40 days, you're dead meat. But actually, it's interesting. In the Hebrew, the word overthrown there, I can't remember how you say it, but it literally means corrected. Brought back into the order you should be. It's not as much about overthrow, although they would get the, the message, either turn or burn. But what God wanted was them to repent so that, and turn from their wicked ways so he could heal their land, just as he tells us in Isaiah that... Um, wait, is it Isaiah? 2 Chronicles 7.14, if my people, this is talking about the church, if my people who are called by my name, whether that's a Jew, a Messianic Jew, that's a Christian, um, you know, we can work out the rest. The point is, is that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. Then I will heal their land. God is giving Nineveh this message. If you will turn from your wicked ways, I will turn you back the way you should be. I will heal you. And it says, when the king heard of it, the king makes a decree. And this is one of the worst dirt bags on earth of the day. And the king hears this. And I'll bet you they showed up and they didn't go... Oh, yes, he stood on the street corner and said, oh, yes, God says, you know, because if you're, if you're doing biblical movies, you know, remember the old ones that were always in a British accent, you know, you know, the difference between a, a racehorse and a British racehorse, a racehorse says, hee, and a British one goes, hee, I just saw that recently, it was funny, I thought, but it so, I bet he didn't get up there and go, well, God says, you know, if you don't turn in the next few days, then um, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. I bet he was so on fire, their ears were burning. I bet that they were like, oh my goodness, this guy can scream. Because I'll bet he was, I just, I don't know. But I think by this time, he is just, you dirtbags are going to burn and die. Yes. And how do we know he had the attitude? Because actually, after he gives the message, he goes up on a hill, up at the side of, the, of, of Nineveh. He goes up on the hill, and he kicks back, and he watches. <laughs> I can't wait. There's no way they're going to repent. There's no way they're going to get in right with God. There's no way. So I'm going to watch. And he's up there just, I mean, he's just like, oh, man. Got his iced tea and his, you know, bonbons and whatever. And he's up there and he is just happy. But what he doesn't know is the king gets a hold of the message. Somebody must have, that had influence, must have came to the king and said, and we are sure it's true. Plus, remember this. God sends his presence ahead of time of his message so that they will sense God speaking. And that's the spirit of God in all of us. Sense God speaking and, and they acknowledge it. And he says, nobody is to eat. No, but not even animals are to eat. And we're to put on sackcloth and ashes. And something I wanted to do today was I wanted to find a bunch of sackcloth and cut it up 
and have us put it on our hands and rub it. Have you ever played with sackcloth? We used to do three, three-legged races in those things. You know, the, the burlap bags. Anyways, so they would put on sackcloth, they'd put ashes on their head, they would lay around, they would lay down and roll around sometimes, they would, but they would definitely pray in that position. It was a position saying, I surrender. I totally surrender. And the king said, not you nor your animals will eat anything or drink anything. I'm trying to remember how long. Does anybody remember? It's here somewhere. Maybe it's the whole 40 days. By decree of the king and of his nobles, no person or animal, herd or flock is to put anything in his mouth, neither to eat or drink water. They must be covered with sackcloth, both people and animals. They are to cry out to God with all of their might. Let each of them turn from his evil way and from the violence they practice. Who knows? Maybe God will change his mind, relent and turn from his fierce anger, and then we won't perish. Hmm. Be careful what you put in your mouth. Be careful what you do. And I'd say, be careful what you put out of your mouth. Because, boy, we can put out of our mouth a lot of things that ought not to happen. As, as uh, Paul says, the Lord says through Paul, may it never be that that mouth that puts out good stuff also puts out bad. So Jonah goes up and he's waiting. He has no idea they're truly repenting because he's not in town. He's up on the hillside going... The barbecue is going to be nice. I wonder if he had any hot dogs. Oh, we wouldn't. (laughs) I wouldn't be very kosher. (laughs) All beef. He had all beef Hebrew national sausages. Good. Those are good. But seriously, he's up there, and he is still attitudinal, and he's watching from above the city, and he's going, I can't wait to watch the bombing of Nineveh. And when it doesn't come, he's getting disappointed. But as he's there, the sun is really, really hot. And I could just see God going, hmm, what does Jonah need the most? A little heat. And so the Lord caused the sun to be extra hot and Jonah is in direct sunlight and he's just wanting to perish he just wants to die and God grows up this carob kind of whatever name plant he grows this plant up around him and it shades him and he's like ah yes that's what I deserve shade while I watch the fireworks And what does God do? In the middle of the night, some itty-bitty parasite starts chewing on the plant, and it's dead by morning, and Jonah's back in the heat, and he's rolling around on the ground, whining and sniveling like a little brat, and he said, I knew you would let them repent. It's not fair. (laughs) And what does God say? He goes, hey, they're my kids too, or they're my kids. And he says, you know, I, I grew that plant up for you so that you could have shade, so that you could be comforted, but you didn't even grow the plant. You didn't do anything for it, and you're mad be- because the plant died, and you didn't do anything to make it live. I grew these people. These are people that I knit together in the womb. Yes, they didn't do what I asked them to do, but I still love them, and I still want them to, to be, repent and be saved. But, but here you are freaking out over a plant. And I am, I am freaking out over people dying. Because God doesn't take pleasure in the death of a sinner. Amen? So the point is, is that God is used Jonah who begrudgingly did his job. Which is probably exactly what the Ninevites needed to hear. Was you're going to die and I'm so glad he had a vein sticking out maybe one over here you ever seen anybody that ticked i have 
I don't know if I ever get veins pop out, but I do know my eyes, when they go to gray, run. No. <laughs> so he's freaking out. He's having a conniption, and it ends with God just saying, listen, they, I have compassion. I love you. And I'm going to give them my mercy and grace. What does he say here? It's actually chapter 4, but this was very displeasing to Jonah. He becomes angry because, of course, God had not roasted them. He prayed to Adonai, that's the Lord. Now, Adonai, didn't I say this would happen when I was still in my own country? That's why I tried to get away to Tarshish ahead of time. I knew you were a God who is merciful and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in grace, and that you relent from inflicting punishment. Therefore, Adonai, please take my life away from me. It's better for me to be dead than alive. And Adonai asked, is it right for you to be so angry? Was justifying his anger based on his point of view. <laughs> Haven't we all? I'd ask your hand. Have you ever justified your anger based on your point of view? Well, good grief, duh. Right? The Lord tells us, in your anger, do not sin. We justify, and hey, when people are doing us dirty, when they're maligning us and they're doing us wrong and they're, they're treating us wrong and they're setting us up and all of that and we're well aware of it all, and when that's going on, you know, it, it, of course, we get angry because we don't appreciate it. But God says, it, is it right for you to be so angry? Because you see, the Ninevites aren't Jonah's kids. Whose kids are the Ninevites? God's. When God wiped out a million-man Ethiopian army who was attacking his kids in Jerusalem, because, I think it was Hezekiah, was the one who took it before the Lord and laid it out before the Lord and said, and, and I'm, I'm probably mixing up a couple stories. One was 150 or something thousand. Anyways, but when God overcame them and wiped out those whole huge armies, do you know there was at no point in time that God wasn't working with, all, with his kids? Even the ones he wiped off the map were his kids. Think of that. All the Ninevites were God's. Whether they belonged to God. Whether they acknowledge God or not, they are still his children. The way I like to explain it is this. Everybody who's ever been born on the face of the earth, well, Adam and Eve included, everybody who's ever been uh, born on the face of the earth is a child of God in that God knit them together in the womb. He has a purpose and a plan for their lives. They have incredible, a, 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 a insurmountable value and potential but not everybody will buy into that. Not everybody will follow him. And so I like to put it this way. Everybody qualifies for the family photo album. But until you come to Christ and ask him to be your Lord and Savior and believe that he died on the cross for your sins, you don't get to move over to the other section of the family album that's called the, the Lamb's Book of Life. That's a different album, frankly. But everybody qualifies as a child of God in the simpleness of the fact that they're created by God. But only those who will choose to follow God get to be in the album called the Lamb's Book of Life. And God wanted the Ninevites to get into this book. They were here and they were horrible. And doesn't the world tend to be a bit bad? And boy, we got some on the face of the earth today that probably might make the Assyrian kings look like pretty nice guys. I'm not sure that, you know, Hitler def definitely made it to that level. But the point is, God wanted to move them over. Was ticked because they didn't deserve it in his eyes. But God goes, hey, they're my kids. They're not yours. So what do we get out of this? So when God tells you to go speak to somebody, when God tells you to love on somebody, he's saying it's not about their qualification, 
It's about the fact that I choose to love them. And I made them to be loved on. I made them to be loved on by himself. Jonah left the city, found a place east of the city. I just want to make sure I'm getting all the details. Where he made himself a shelter, sat down under its shade to see what would happen to the city. And Adonai God prepared a castor bean plant and made it grow up over Jonah for shade. At dawn the next day, God prepared a worm which attacked the plant so that it dried up. Then, when the sun rose, God prepared a scorching east wind. Wasn't that nice of him? It was God using a scorching east wind. Because Jonah needed a little shake and bake. He needed to get shook out of his comfort zone. He needed to get shook up, and he needed to feel what it is to be outside of the blessing of God. God prepared a scorching wind. The sun beat down on his head so hard that he grew faint and begged that he could die, saying, it'd be better off not alive. God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be so angry about the plan? Jonah answers, yes, it's right for me to be angry that I could die. Adonai says, you're concerned over this plant, which costs you no effort. You didn't make it grow. And it came up in a night and perished in a night. So shouldn't I be concerned about Nineveh, where 120,000 of my kids live who don't know their right from their left, not to mention all the animals? If you ever wanted to find a verse that says all, gods go to he- all dogs go to heaven, this might be it. In other words, God cares about the animals. Why he mentions the animals, I don't know. There's two different verses in the Bible where God makes it clear he cares about the animals. Not the same as us. But the point is, he says there's 120,000 people who don't understand right from wrong. And it turns out the king was one of them. And I got to thinking, I never considered the king didn't know the right from wrong. Until this time, through the book, and I read it, I don't know, four, five, ten times, But this time, I I realize it appears the king didn't even know better. Now, isn't that something? How do you end up with a king that doesn't know any better? Well, where do kings generally come from? People. What do people make their decisions based on? Their foundations. If they've never known from the wrong, then how can they make a good decision? And God is saying to Jonah, there are 120,000 people who don't know how to make a good decision the way you would want it done. Why would you expect anything less or anything more? What this to us is this. God knows where you're at. God knows where you've been. God knows what you've been through. God knows the details of your life. God knows whether you've been the worst dirtbag that's ever lived on the face of the earth, or, and most likely you're not because you're here, (laughs) but God knows that whether you've done horrific things or small bad things or big bad things or whatever it is, God knows all the details. He's still saying to you, I want you to be saved. 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 I don't want you to perish in your sin. I don't want you to perish in your way of thinking, in your way of life. I want you to trust me. And we said it on the radio the other day, and we do a radio program, which should be airing right now. But here's the deal. What we were saying is just this. God wants you to know him. God wants you to to see him. God wants you to receive from him. And even if you don't know him, he still wants you. And here's what I was trying to get to is this. He wants you to admit you're a sinner. He wants you to believe in Jesus and the resurrection, confess it with your mouth and call upon his name. And the reason he wants you to do that is because he wants you saved. God wants that for you no matter what, and, and this is what we talked about was this, even if you don't, 
If you don't know much of nothing about God, he's saying, would you just hold my pinky? Now, Mira is old enough that she can get the hand a little better. But when she was just almost three, when she came into our, fa- our, our lives and uh, we inherited her, they still think that's funny. Anyways, um, but she was just holding pinkies then. You know, just, but she, here's the deal. God is not, is not nervous about you just holding his pinky and going, God, I don't, I don't know you. I don't understand you. I don't know that I believe you. I don't know that I believe your word. But what I've heard of you and what I've sensed of you, I want to follow. I want to follow. Can I, can I hold your pinky for a while? That's all the further I understand. Can I, can I follow you just that much for a while? You know what? God is never intimidated by, saying, by somebody saying, God, I want to date you. He's not. He has no problem with that. You know why? Because he's a perfect gentleman. And as a perfect gentleman, he never forces you into anything. And, and when you say, I want to try you out, God. I want to try dating you. I want to... Can we have lunch together? Can we, can we hang out a little bit so I can get to know you? He's like, yes. With all of his heart, he says, yes. I want to spend time with you. One of my favorite songs over the years is, uh, I miss my time with you. Those moments together. I want to be with you each day. And it hurts me when you say you're too busy, busy trying to serve me. But how can you serve me if your spirit's empty? There's a longing in my heart, wanting more than just a part of you. It's true. I miss my time with you. And it goes on from there. Wants to spend time with you. God longs to get his arms around you. God longs to hang out with you. God longs to sup with you. And be with you. And, and, and talk with you. And, and he longs to explain himself to you. And yeah, he does that in his word. But if you haven't been a follower of the Lord yet... If you haven't known his word, if you don't know how to, you know, maybe navigate the Bible or whatever, that's what we're for. The reason that God doesn't have us be saved and just immediately take us is because that means we still got work to do. If we get to go quickly, well, then we get to go quickly. But, the, but if we're still here, then part of our work and part of our job that Jesus gave us, he said, go and make learners of me, disciples. Teaching them, well, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything I've commanded. Well, what did he command? That's all. Just this. Just the Bible. And here's the thing. Just read it. You won't understand everything. Just read it. Because when you need the information, he'll make it come alive in you. And you will be able to respond so that you can be saved. Or in that moment to help you in your time of need. Amen? God longed to save the life of a nation. And if you saw those scriptures that were at the end, that were were from the book of Nahum, one hundred years later, the Ninevites had gone back to living the way they had been. And God had already given them their last warning, and they were wiped off the map. And when they found Nineveh in 1823, 26, whatever that was, when they found Nineveh, they found some alabaster stones that were burnt to a point. That's a little hot. <laughs> God doesn't want you to be destroyed. God doesn't want any of his kids to be destroyed. We may feel like they deserve it. 
for whatever the reason may be. But God, as he spoke it to me the other day, is just like Jonah, we are being told by the Lord to, con- to let others be forgiven, to consider their value before God, that they too deserve to have God love on them. Maybe they don't deserve it by action, but they deserve it by his choice. Amen? And God wants to minister to his kids. So I'm going to ask if everybody just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. And I'm just going to ask you a simple question. If today you've heard about the Lord and he has spoke to your heart and you want to try him out, you want to maybe date him or hold his pinky or maybe you want to go full in because you're ready for that. But if today that's you and you just want to try him out and you want to follow him and get to know him and see that is this really real, if that's you today, while every other eye is bowed and head closed, (laughs) heads bowed and eyes closed, would you just put your hand up before the Lord just to say, I want to try him. I want to follow him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, be bold. Be bold. Very courageous. Be bold. You'll never forget. You'll never regret it. Never regret it. If that's you today, and I would ask everybody to help in this prayer, would you just pray this prayer with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I need your help. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross to forgive me of my sins. Thank you for your compassion. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Let me follow you all the days of my life. Lead me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to tell you something. If you made that choice today, and we had a few people that did, I want to tell you, God is so excited. (laughs) You might not have been as bad as the Assyrians. You might not have been as bad as Jonah. Maybe not even close. But it says all heaven just happened. Your decision. They just broke out. Whoa! right because you are saved you are no longer who you were you're just saying lord just your pinky i don't understand and just your pinky is all i can handle i just i just need to know more to go further and he's going i love it love it when you do that think about when my kids were little and Mira's tried to do it, and I keep hurting myself, so it doesn't work too good. But, you know, where the kid clamps onto your leg and you're trying to walk? <laughs> you know, don't you love it? And it, it might even hurt, and you still do. God is so overjoyed. Stand with me this morning. Father God, I pray for these, your kids. Lord, I pray a protection over them. Way beyond anything they've ever experienced before. I pray your presence upon them more than they've ever experienced before. Lord, I know the enemy's trying to kill me and take me out. That's just the part of being on the front lines. But God, what I do know is this. I know that you are who you are because you know what your plans are and how you want to do it. 
So, Lord, I submit to you. All that I am is yours. Everything I have is yours. And Lord, I pray for those that are here and those that will hear this and those that will see this. Lord God, I pray that they would receive from you such faith that they'll also say, everything I have is yours. Have your way with my life. Lead me, Lord. And God, thank you. Thank you for your kids being here today. Thank you for the honor and privilege I have of getting to be a part of their lives. I appreciate that. So I sing this blessing over you. You're welcome to sing along if you know it. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Lord set his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. 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 May God's favor rest upon you in power. May God's protection be on you in power. May God's leading be on you in power. May God lead you strongly. May he protect you well. And may you follow him with an insatiable desire to know his word and himself. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Love you. May the Lord bless the meal back there.